Senator Graham, it's all yours. Thank you. So far, has the hearings been what you thought they would be? <laughs> I'm not sure I had, um, uh, I, I'm not sure I exactly pictured it, so. Let's try to go back in time and say you're watching these hearings and you were critical of the way the Senate conducted these hearings. Are we, <laughs> are we improving or going backwards? <laughs> And are you doing your part? <laughs> I think that you've been exercising your constitutional responsibilities <laughs> extremely well. So it's all those other guys that suck, not us, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it was all I'm, those other witnesses I'm... that were too cagey, right? <laughs> all right, fair enough. Now, do you know Greg Craig? I would say one thing, <laughs> Senator Please. Graham, which is, it just feels a lot different from here than it felt from I, back then. I, I bet it does. <laughs> and it feels a lot different when you're the nominee, too, doesn't it? And if it didn't, I'd really be worried about you. Um, do you know Greg Crick? I do. Who is he? Uh, he was previously the counsel to the president. Do you know him well? <coughs> Pretty well? Uh, you know, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's he a will. good guy. I'm not trying to trick you. Yeah. I mean, I don't... Yeah. <laughs> I don't have anything on Greg. I like him fine. Uh, he said on May 16th that you, that you're largely a progressive in the mold of Obama himself. Do you agree with that? Senator Graham, uh, you know, in terms of my political views, I've been a Democrat all my life. I've That's worked for two Democratic presidents, and uh, those are, you know, that's uh, that's what my political views are. And would you consider them, your political views progressive? My political views are, are, are generally progressive, generally. Compared to mine, for sure, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK, that's fine. I mean, there's no harm in that. And this makes the hearings a little more interesting. I would be shocked if President Obama did not pick someone that shared his general view of the law and life. And so elections have consequences. Do you agree with that? Elections do have consequences. It would be hard to disagree that elections have consequences. Right. And, and, one of the, and one of the consequences is a president gets to fill a nomination for the Supreme Court. That's a power the president has, right? Yes, sir. So it'd be okay, from your point of view, if a conservative president picks someone in the mold of a conservative person. I would expect that. There we go. Good. We'll remember that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we may have a chance to... Bring those words back. Uh, do you know Miguel Estrada? I do. How do you know him? Uh, so Miguel and I were classmates at Harvard Law School, but we were more than classmates at Harvard Law School. Harvard Law School has a, a way of, um, has required seating in the first year. And Miguel and I were Trust required. me, I don't know, because I could have never gotten there, but I trust you, okay. Miguel and I <laughs> were required to sit next to each other in every single class in the first year. And um, I can tell you, Miguel takes extraordinary notes. So it's great. Every time you missed something in class, you could just kind of look over. And, um, but that's how I know Miguel, and we've been uh, good friends ever since. What's your general opinion of his legal abilities and his character? I think he is a great lawyer and a great human being. He wrote a letter on your behalf. Have you had a chance to read it? I did. Can I read part of it? I write in support of Elaine, Elena Kagan's confirmation as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. I've known Elena for 27 years. We met as first year law students at Harvard and where we were assigned seats next to each other. So you're consistent for all our classes. We were later colleagues as editors of the Law Review and as law clerks to different Supreme Court justices, and we have been friends uh, since. Elena possesses a formidable intellect, an exemplary temperament, and a rare ability to disagree with others without being disagreeable. She is calm under fire and mature and deliberate in her judgments. Elena also would also bring to the court a wealth of experience at the highest levels of our government and of academics including teaching at the University of Chicago, serving as the dean of the Harvard Law School, and experience at the White House as a current Solicitor General of the United States. If such a person who has, been, who has demonstrated great intellect, high accomplishments, and an upright life 
is not easily confirmable, I fear we will have reached a point where no capable person will readily accept a nomination for judicial service. What do you think about those comments? Senator Graham, I think that those comments reflect what an extraordinary human being Miguel Estrada is. And I, I was um, deeply touched when I read that letter, deeply grateful to him, of course. And um, uh, all the nice things that he said about me, I would say back about him double. Well, I'm going to give you that chance because Miguel Estrada, as most people know, maybe not everyone, was nominated by President Bush to the court, and he never made it. I think it's one of the great tragedies for the country that he was never able to sit on an appellate court. But that's the past. And I do think it reflects well of him that he would say such things about you. And quite frankly, I think it reflects well of you that you would say such things about him. In your opinion, Ms. Kagan, is he qualified to sit as an appellate judge? He's qualified to sit as an appellate judge. He's qualified to sit as a Supreme Court justice. Well, your stock really went up with me. So what I would like you to do, since you might one day be on the court yourself, is to, if you don't mind at my request, write a letter to me, um, short as long as you like it, about Miguel Estrada. Would you be willing to do that in the next couple of days? I would be pleased to do that, Senator Graham. Thank you. Now, let's talk about the war. As Solicitor General of the United States, you represent the United States government for the Supreme Court, right? I do. Okay, let's shift gears here. And you had to get confirmed before this body for that job. Do you remember that confirmation process? I do. Do you remember me? I do remember okay, you. Okay, good. <laughs> do you remember when I asked you, are we at war? And you said? Yes. Okay. Now, that is a bold statement to make, but an accurate statement. What does it mean? Who are we at war with? And what does that mean in terms of this nation's legal policy? Well, we're at war with al-Qaeda and the Taliban. And under the AUMF, uh, the president has a wide range of authorities with respect to those groups. Now, under domestic criminal law, as we know it today, is there any provisions in our domestic criminal law that would allow you to hold someone indefinitely without trial? Uh, not that I know of, Senator Graham. And quite frankly, they shouldn't be, should there? No, sir. Now, under the law of armed I feel as though we're doing this again. We are. We're I, sort of doing an instant yeah, replay. Yeah, yeah, yes, we're going to do this again, and I hope we get the same answers. <laughs> that will help you a lot if we do. Uh, <laughs> and if we don't, we'll have a problem. Uh, under the law of armed conflict, is it permissible to hold an enemy combatant as long as the holding force deems them to be dangerous? Under the traditional law of war, it is permissible to hold an enemy combatant until the end of hostilities. And right. the idea behind that is that the enemy combatant uh, not be enabled to return to the battlefield. That's a, that's a good summary. The problem with this war is there will never be a definable end to hostilities, will there? That is exactly the problem, Senator okay. Graham. And, and, and Hamdi um, very briefly discussed this problem, the court in Hamdi, suggesting that perhaps if this war was so different from the traditional law of war that there might need to be alternative procedures to put in place. For example, one could imagine a system in which, uh, because of the duration of this war, uh, it was necessary to ensure the enemy combatants continuing dangerousness. That is a question that I think has not been answered by the court. Do you believe it would serve this country well if the Congress tried to work with the executive branch to provide answers to that question and others? Well, Senator Graham, let me take the question and make it into a legal question because I think it's directly relevant under the Youngstown analysis whether Congress and the President do work together. When the two are together, the courts find more power, not less, right? That is correct. Okay, now you're still Solicitor General of the United States. From that point of view, would you urge this Congress to work with the executive branch to, find, to create statutes to help the courts better answer these questions? Well, Senator Graham, I, I, I think I don't want to talk as, uh, as Solicitor General as to legal policy here. Okay. But I will say, Go ahead. Uh, as to the legal matter, 
that it makes a difference. Uh, and uh, whether Congress and the President work together, that courts should take note of that, that courts should, um, when, when that occurs, the action is at, uh, it ought to be given the most deference, and that there's a reason for that. It's right. because the courts are basically saying Congress and the President have come together. Congress and the President have agreed upon a, a policy jointly, and there should be deference in those circumstances. Are you familiar with Judge Lambert and Judge Hogan? I, I don't know either of them. I know who they are. Well, fair enough. They're D.C. Uh, judges, um, uh, federal district court judges, who are hearing habeas appeals from Gitmo detainees. And I'll provide you some of the comments they made. It is unfortunate, according to Judge Hogan, it is unfortunate in my view that the legislative branch of the government and the executive branch have not moved more strongly to provide uniform, clear rules and laws for handling these cases. And I've got other quotes that I will provide you. What I'm trying to do here is lay the foundation for the idea that our laws that exist today do not recognize the dilemma the country faces. The administration has determined that 48 people held at Gitmo are too dangerous to let go, but are not going to be subject to normal criminal proceedings. In other words, we believe the evidence suggests they're members of Al-Qaeda. They've all gone before a habeas judge, and the judge agreed, but they're never going to be tried in a traditional fashion. Is the administration's decision in your opinion, consistent with the power under the law of war to do that? Well, as Solicitor General, Senator Graham, uh, I have uh, argued the position that this is I think this very is fully well, legal. very well, you have argued for the proposition that this president and all future presidents has the ability to detain an enemy combatant with sufficient process uh, if the executive branch believes that they're dangerous and not require them to go through a normal criminal trial. And what we have to do is find out what that process would be, this hybrid system. You argued against expanding habeas rights to Bagram detainees held in Afghanistan. Is that correct? I did, Senator Graham. As a matter of fact, you won. Uh, in the D.C. circuit. In, in and you probably won't be able to hear that case if it comes to the Supreme Court, will you? Well, that's correct. And in, in the, in the, uh, the reason... Well, that's good because we can talk openly about it. I mean, if I, if, I could, if I could just say, in, in general, uh, the Solicitor General only signs her name to briefs in the Supreme Court, right. authorizes appeal, but does not sign appellate briefs. But I, I determined that I should be the counsel of record on right. that brief because I thought that the United States interests were so strong in that case based on what the Department of Defense told our office. Well, about I want, right. I want every conservative legal scholar and commentator to know that you did an excellent job, in my view, of representing the United States uh, when it came to that case. And you said previously that the first person you have to convince when you make, when you submit a brief or take a case on is yourself. Is that correct? Well, I said that in, in, in reference to the cases that I argued specifically. Uh -huh. Of course, when I, when I write briefs, uh, I write from, or when I sign briefs, uh, when I'm counsel of record on briefs, I'm um, uh, taking the position of the United States, that I'm representing the position that I believe and that our office believes is most consistent with the long-term interests of the United States government. Have you convinced yourself, as well as representing the United States government, it would be a disaster for the war effort if federal judges could intervene uh, and require the release of people in detention in Afghanistan under military control? Senator Graham, I chose to uh, put my name on that brief, as I said, uh, which is a very, very rare thing in the appellate courts, because I believe that there were very significant United well, States... Let me read a uh, quote. The federal court should not become the vehicle by which the executive is forced to choose between two intolerable options, submitting to intrusive and harmful discovery or releasing a dangerous detainee. Do you stand by that statement? Senator Graham, can I ask whether that statement comes from that brief? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> um, I, no, I, 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 
I mean, that statement is my best understanding of the very significant interests of the United States government in that case, which we tried forcefully to present to the court. And um, as you said before, uh, the D.C. Circuit, uh, uh, a very mixed panel of the D.C. Circuit, right. uh, upheld our argument. You also said the courts of the United States have never entertained habeas lawsuits filed by enemy forces detained in war zones. If courts are ever to take that radical step, they should do so only with explicit blessing by statute. Stand by that? Uh, anything that is in that brief, I stand by as the appropriate position of the United States government. Well, the brief needs to be read by your supporters and your critics, because some of your supporters are going to be unnerved by it. Some of your critics may like what's in there. I'm here to say, from my point of view, that this area of your legal life, you represent the United States well. And I hope that Congress will rise to the occasion, working with the executive, to provide some clarity so that we will be able to find a way to fight this war within our value system and recognize the difference between fighting war and fighting crime. The battlefield, you told me during our previous discussions that the battlefield in this war is the entire world, that if someone were caught in the Philippines, who was a financier of al-Qaeda, and they were captured in the Philippines, they would be subject to enemy combatant determination uh, because the whole world's the battlefield. Do you still agree with that? Well, Senator, I was speaking there as a legal policy matter representing the position of the Obama administration. That's obviously a very different role as the advocate role that I play it is also a different well, Let's role. just stop there. When you were an advocate, you had no problem advocating that position. Um, uh, there are certain parts of that that, that, I, that I think that we have not addressed in the United States government. So um, the United States government has argued that the battlefield extends beyond Iraq and Afghanistan. Attorney General Holder said that the battlefield is the hearts, the minds, and wherever al-Qaeda may reside. Do you believe that is a consistent statement with Obama policy? Senator Graham, when I was here before, you asked me if I agreed with the Attorney General, and I said that it would be bad to disagree with the Attorney General, given my position. And I'm still the Solicitor General, and I still agree with the Attorney General. But you strike me as the kind of the person, if you thought he was wrong, you'd say so, even though it may cost you a job. Am I right in assuming that? I, I certainly would tell him if I thought he was wrong. And I think you would tell me if you thought he was wrong. So I'm going to assume you thought he was right, because that's the kind of person you are. And I, and I quite frankly, think he's right. Now, um, as we move forward and deal with law of war issues, Christmas Day bomber, where are you at on Christmas Day? Senator Graham, that is an undecided legal issue, which, uh, it, the, uh, well, I, I suppose I should ask exactly what you mean by that. I'm assuming that the question you mean is uh, whether a person who was apprehended in the United States is... No, I just asked you where you're at on Christmas. <laughs> You know, like all Jews, I was probably at a Chinese restaurant. Uh, great answer. Great answer. You know, I could almost, I could almost see that one coming, and I thought, yeah. I just... Me too. So you were celebrating... Senator, Senator Schumer explained this to me earlier. Yeah, he did. If so I might, with, no other restaurants are open. Right. You were with your family on, on Christmas Day at a Chinese restaurant. Okay. Yes, sir. That's great. That's what Hanukkah and Christmas is all about. <laughs> now, what happened in Detroit on Christmas Day? Can you recall? What was so unnerving about that day? Well, that there was a uh, failed, but, but only just failed, terrorist incident. We were lucky as a nation that a bunch of people didn't get killed on Christmas Day or in the middle of Hanukkah, whatever holiday it may be, aren't we? We're lucky that bomb didn't go off. Senator Graham, it, was a, it seemed a, a close thing, and I don't know more than I read in the newspapers about that incident. I was not you know, involved in, in any of the discussions about what right. to do on that day. Right. The Times Square incident, you recall that, right? Yes, sir. We were lucky that van didn't explode. You know, every time one of these things happens, 
uh, it is extremely unnerving and, and uh, you know, makes us aware of the need to take um, uh, efforts to make sure that such a thing never. Tell me about Miranda warnings. Do we need to read soldiers, do soldiers need to read people, their rights captured in a battlefield in Afghanistan? Um, Senator, the way Miranda warnings would come up is, of course, only with respect to the admissibility of evidence in a criminal court. Um, uh, so to the extent that we're talking about a battlefield capture and not a, a, uh, a criminal trial, an Article III criminal trial, um, the Miranda issue would never come up. So you agree with me that in war, you don't have to read the enemy their rights because you're not talking about fighting crime, you're talking about fighting war, is that correct? Well, the Miranda issue is only applicable in Article Three courts as a matter of criminal law. Okay. If you catch a person in Afghanistan... I should, I should correct that. No. I should correct that because I think that the question uh, of whether Miranda is applicable in military commissions has not been decided. Right. Well, you have Article 31 rights, which are the same thing, but that is yet to be decided. But under general rule of war, you don't, you don't read the enemy the Article 31 rights when you're in a firefight. For these hearings to be meaningful and, in, and instructive, I think it's good for us to have an open discussion about when we are fighting a war and when we're fighting a crime and what's the consequences of criminalizing this war. My fear is that if we criminalize this war, we're going to get Americans killed for no higher purpose. And that the idea that you would take someone off an airplane or in Times Square and start reading them their Miranda rights within a few hours is criminalizing the war because the reason we're capturing these people initially is to find out what they know about the enemy. Do you have any concerns that reading Miranda rights to suspected terrorists caught in the United States would impede our ability to collect intelligence? Senator Graham, I, I, I've never dealt with that question uh, as Solicitor General, and um, well, just as Elena Kagan, S S Senator Graham, I feel Harvard as Law I'm, School Dean. I'm a part of this administration, and I think that you know I should let the Attorney General. Well, well let me tell you, the administration, generally speaking, has been pretty good to work with on this issue. We have had discussions about having exceptions to Miranda so that we don't lose intelligence gathering opportunities and not criminalize the war. What does the public safety exception mean when it comes to Miranda? What's your understanding? So the public safety exception, which is, uh, comes from the Quarles case, it's, 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 it's right now, I, th I think, a limited exception. It enables... Very limited. That's right. Very it, undefined. It enables the police essentially to uh, uh, be able to question, to, to, to find the gun, you know, to find something that might pose an imminent risk of uh, uh, public safety. Now, let's stop there. So the public safety exception is about protecting the law enforcement officers and maybe securing the crime scene. What I'm trying to illustrate is that the, Moran the public safety exception I'm looking for would allow the intelligence community to find out about where this guy came from. Where did you train? Is there another attack coming? And right now the law is very, do you think it would be in the United States' best interest to have clear guidance to our intelligence community, give them the tools and the flexibility when they capture one of these guys, whether it be in Times Square or in Detroit, to find out without having to do anything else at the moment, what's the next attack? What do you know about future attacks? Where did you train? Would that make us a more secure nation if our intelligence and law enforcement community had those tools, in your opinion? Well, of course, it's a question that might come before the court in some guise as to whether the public safety exception should apply. I'm just talking about being an American now. Forget about the courts. As an American, a patriotic American, liberal or conservative, don't you believe that we would all be better off if we had the opportunity within our values, humanely without torture, to hold a terrorist suspect and, in, and gather intelligence 
before we did anything else because another attack may be coming. Not that a gun's in the next room, but somebody else may be coming our way. Don't you think as a average everyday citizen that would make us a safer nation? I, I suppose on this one, Senator Graham, that I'm reluctant to say how I would think about the question as an average everyday citizen because I might have to think about the question as a judge and that would be a different way of thinking about the question. Okay, let's talk about what a judge may think about here. If we applied domestic criminal law to the, to the war on terror without any uh, hybrid mix, would that be a good thing? I mean, if we took the, the, the war on terror and just made it a crime, would we be limiting our ability to defend ourselves? Well, uh, 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 as we discussed before, Senator Graham, I mean, the administration of which I'm a part. But here's what I don't understand is because you said to me previously that you understand why this administration are holding 48 people without trial because they're enemy combatants, and that makes sense to you. What yes, I'm trying to, trying to extrapolate is if we took other parts of criminal law and applied it to the war on terror, would that create a problem for this country? I guess I feel... Like, like Miranda warnings. Yes, I, I mean, I, I, the, the, the question of um, detention of enemy combatants is one that I've dealt with as Solicitor General, is one that I've argued as Solicitor General. Uh, this is a question that I have not dealt with, and, and I'm... Uh, hesitant to, to, to make any comments about uh, in a personal view or in a policy view, given that these questions I, I think are likely to come before the court. The question of the good faith exception to Miranda, how it applies to terrorism cases, um, is, is, is I think quite likely to, to, to get to the court. Is it fair to say that the letter you wrote to me about the Detainee Treatment Act Amendment, I think you you call the Graham Kyle proposal that it would lead to a dictatorship or no I didn't say that what'd you say uh, I, I'm not easily offended you could say that <laughs> probably helped me in South Carolina after Harvard <laughs> Law School <laughs> they would say that <laughs> so I'm not but then I'll say anything <laughs> no, you want. No, no. back home it wouldn't hurt that the Harvard Law School Dean was mad at Lindsay but <laughs> but but you did you made you wrote a letter that was pretty pretty challenging uh, what did, what did you it, it was a challenging letter. letter. Senator I got Graham, it. I, think, I mean, I'll give it to I, you. I think I said that we hold, you know, dictatorships to high standards, and we should hold ourselves to even higher ones. But I did, I did uh, criticize the initial Graham Amendment for. And that's absolutely okay. That's absolutely okay. You did criticize the original Graham Amendment, and I didn't take it personally. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. But you did say that's what dictatorships do, and I thought that was a little over the top. But the difference between the Graham-Kyle Amendment and the amendment that passed by 84 votes wasn't a whole, what's the, two diff what's the difference between what I proposed and what passed? Right. Well, I, I think one difference was that uh, military commission adjudications now receive D.C. Circuit review. And in fact, the letter we wrote was about that, was saying that military commission adjudication... Now, did you assume that we precluded uh, final verdicts and military commissions from Article Three review? Well, uh, my initial understanding of, of the initial uh, Graham we, Amendment... We didn't, but I, I, you could have had that understanding, but I can assure you that wasn't my goal. The, the point I'm trying to make here is that the, the Military Commission Act of 2009 has been a work in progress for, for, for many, many years. And we're trying to, as a nation, get this right. As Solicitor General, do you have confidence in our military commissions that we've set up? Do you find that they're a fair form to try people in? Senator Graham, I really haven't had any exposure to the military commissions as yet. Of course, there's, there's been no military, military commission proceeding. Have you had exposure to military lawyers? I think that they are absolutely top-notch. What if I told you that the same lawyers who will be doing the commissions are also the same lawyers, judges, and juries that would try our own, our own troops? Would that make you feel better? Well, I, I, I do think that the military lawyers with whom I've had the, the, the pleasure and honor to work as Solicitor General are stunningly good. So is it fair to say that Elena Kagan, whatever day it is in 2010, doesn't believe that military commissions are a miscarriage or justice or unconstitutional, or I guess I'll strike unconstitutional. 
do you believe that this country submitting a a suspected terrorist to military commission trial is within our value system? Senator Graham, I'm the part of an administration that clearly has stated that some people. Uh, do you personally feel comfortable with that? I do. I wouldn't be in Thank this administration you. if I didn't. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Graham. Uh, before I go to Senator Schumer, I.